You're listening to Let's Talk About Fatherlessness with host Sean Tice, where we talk about leading fatherless families to the Heavenly Father. Hey, my name is Sean Tice, and this is Let's Talk About Fatherlessness. I'm excited to have my friend with us today named Ron Howenstein. He's with the Spokane Fatherhood Initiative. It's great to have you, Ron. Thank you for having me, Sean. And uh, it's I've followed your work, and you're doing a, a, a great work. You have a fabulous ministry. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Well, thank you so much. And and tell us tell us a little bit about yourself and work you know with your ministry, wherever you want to share. Well, I uh, had a career being self-employed as a life insurance agent, so I was able to put a lot of time into volunteer work. And and really, the genesis of what we're doing with fathers um, probably started with the book called The Externally Focused Church. And I became convicted that uh, the church wasn't doing enough to serve the community, and that we as individuals needed to take a, a posture of being missional Christians, that we're on mission wherever we live, whatever we're doing, that, that 24 hours a day, we're on assignment from God. And in fact, I developed a, a slogan that my circumstance is my assignment, you know, no matter where I find myself. So out of that um, motivation to serve the community, I said, well, if I'm going to advocate for this, I ought to be doing it. And I became a volunteer to uh, shelter for homeless women and children here in Spokane, a faith-based ministry, the Union Gospel Mission. And I had a very um, very intense experience there for 10 years. I often spend 10 hours a week. I'd teach there. Uh, My wife and I became uh, quite connected to many of the moms. But I saw all these moms, all these kids, sometimes two and three and four kids from two and three and four different dads. Uh, Nobody was getting child support. Very few of these women had ever been married. Most of them didn't want anything to do with the fathers of their children or their fathers or the children were, were unreliable. And I, I thought, oh, this is a, a vast contrast to the way I was raised. I grew up in a little farming town where everybody was married. Everybody had a mom and dad. Teen pregnancy was extremely rare. If a guy got a girl pregnant, he married her sometimes the next day. You know, it was a code of honor among men. That if I'm going to bring children into the world, I'm going to take care of them. And we've really lost that. It's very, very disturbing. And it grieves me greatly um, that we have a culture that that doesn't, demand that from men, frankly. So um, out of, so I'm talking to people about starting a fatherhood ministry. And it was a really interesting response. Nearly everyone I talked to said that is so needed. That is so needed. And this was you know, 12 years ago. Um, then along came an article in Christianity Today magazine, April of 2012. And the headline said, where have all the fathers gone? Mm. And it was a profile of Richmond, Virginia. And the city leaders there became convicted that fatherlessness was a public health problem, just like venereal disease. And they began funding a program called the Richmond Fathered Initiative. And Becky and I actually went back and visited some of the people connected to that on one of our trips to the East Coast. And then in January of 2016, about 100 Christian leaders gathered at the Union Gospel Mission to talk about how the church can serve the community. I was not part of the leadership that organized that. Fatherlessness was not on the agenda. I was not a speaker. Spoke I hadn't even born yet. The Spokane Father Initiative. But um, when challenged by the facilitator, the out-of-town facilitator, to come up with one issue that was the number one issue facing the city, each table was allowed to to vote, and each table could have only one issue. And eight out of ten tables, excuse me, ten out of twelve tables said the same thing: fatherlessness. It would just mm-hmm. blew my mind. And his too, this this facilitator had led this kind of conversation on every continent except Antarctica. And he'd never seen community unanimity, you know, a unanimous voice like that speaking for one thing. You'd think passionate Christian leaders, there'd be all kinds of things that people would be voting for to help the city. But somehow God had seated people around the room at those tables. So January 2017, we had a fatherhood conference. Uh, July 2017, we incorporated. Uh, September of 2018, we began teaching fatherhood classes using the National Fatherhood Initiative uh, 24-7 dad curriculum. And since then, we've issued over 550 certificates of completion to men who've completed those programs. And we've we've had just an amazing expansion since then. So, wow, next, that's, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So you're just, you're just, you just jumped all in. God put it on your heart and, you know, I, I love your story. I love how that you're just, Hey, well, there's a need here. Let's address it. And I think that that's so wonderful. Yeah. And if, and honestly, if, if 
more Christians would do that. If we would see the need and take the lead, then we would, you know, imagine the difference we could make in this nation. And so I really appreciate how you're, how you and your wife are doing that. Well, thanks. We've been very blessed, very fortunate financially uh, to have the money to do this, to have the time freedom to do it. I, you know, I understand not, you know, not everybody can do what I've done, um, yeah. but we want to, we want to honor God. We want to be good stewards of what he's given us. So, yeah. Well, let's dig, dig deeper into exactly what you guys do. And so I, I, you okay. know, I see different things you're posting, but tell us how it works. So, you know, if you're a dad that wants to get more engaged or how do you, how yeah. do you find the dads? You know, tell us more about how, how it all works. We started out using, uh, having our classes at a uh, faith-based, um, not faith-based, recovery-based church, excuse me. So um, that pastor there helped us recruit most of the first class. Our first class was 12 men. 12 out of 12 had some form of criminal history. 12 out of 12 uh, were in some form of addiction recovery. 10 out of 12 were non-custodial dads. One wasn't even a dad yet. And another one um, had just gotten married and taken on three stepdaughters. So he was terrified. Uh, So out of that, over time, that was in September 2018, we developed a reputation in the community. Uh, we communicated very aggressively with social service agencies around the community. And um, and I was pretty, I had a lot of those connections already because of my work with the Union Gospel Mission. And then a year later, the state of Washington came to us and said, we hear good things about this fatherhood program you got going. We want you to teach these classes to men in the child welfare system. So we signed a contract with them, and uh, for a season there, about half of our students were referrals from the state. Um, mm-hmm. We were doing well until COVID hit, and we were, all, we were only doing face-to-face in Spokane. COVID hit, and I was really, really stunned how easily we transitioned to Zoom. But within 10 days, we were up and running on Zoom. We had just finished session six out of 12. Every one of the guys that were in session six completed the class. We, we didn't lose a student in that process. So we realized then if, if we have this Zoom technology, we're not confined to just Spokane. So we said to the state, can you start referring people to us from across the state? And they did. And so um, we have client, you know, clients, I should, we have men who graduated from our program who are in Western Washington. Um, most interestingly, uh, in our most recent graduation last week, we had a guy from Brazil. Uh, he zoomed in from Brazil. He has a, a, a child custody case in Spokane. He comes to Spokane regularly, but his work takes him around the world. And uh, most of the time he, he called in from Brazil, but another, one time he called in from Singapore. So <clears throat> we've, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we are now getting referrals. We, we don't have to do much marketing to get men to come to us. So social service agencies know about us. The courts know about us. Uh, probation officers know about us and we we work just you know work those connections let people know and 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 there's a huge hunger in those agencies for something for men there really is they 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 know that men are lost and broken and leaderless and and so when they see something positive come along specifically targeted men they jump on it and they support it that's so, so good no yeah go ahead, keep going well um so we our, our flagship activity is the 24-7 dad classes from the National Fatherhood Initiative. There are 12 sessions, and there's a, a basic and an advanced class. So if some guy takes the basic class and then, and then moves on to the advanced class, he's going to get a total of 48 hours of fatherhood instruction from us, classroom instruction, hanging around other men and talking about the issues of fatherhood. Think about this. How many dads get one hour of fatherhood instruction? Most most dads get none, zero, <clears throat> and these guys um, get forty eight. One of the things that astonishes me is our graduation rate. We have a ninety two percent graduation. Rate. Out of out of those twelve classes, you can miss one. We allow one absence, and um, if you miss more than one, you, you have to do a makeup in order to graduate. And we don't allow more than three absences. If you miss three, you got to start over. Uh, you don't get wow. a certificate. So that's a testament, testimony to the commitment of the men who are taking these classes. But we also must be offering something valuable. It, it probably really is my dad jokes that's bringing it back, I'm sure. 
you know. <laughs> um, the national average for that curriculum is about a 50% graduation rate. Mm-hmm. So we've got we've got something special going on here. I don't know if you realize this, but Spokane is the birthplace of Father's Day. Oh. Yeah, go go look it up on Wikipedia and you'll see the story of um woman's mother died. She had five siblings and in the early 1900s saw all this support for moms and nothing for dads and her dad was raising her and her you know five siblings by himself so she asked every church in spokane in june of 1910 to preach a sermon on fathers oh, and wow. every church in spokane did and it took a long time she uh, lobbied for a father's day for a while and then had a season where she she gave that up and then picked it up again. It wasn't until Richard Nixon's presidency, 1972, that it was declared a national, and we call it a national holiday, like Mother's Day is a national holiday. It's not a federal paid holiday, of course. But. So anyway, it's <clears throat> it's in our spiritual soil here in Spokane, this, this issue of fatherhood. So we we one of the issues that we knew was a, a real pain point for our dads all along, and it was the subject of, of family law court and custody issues and child support payments and the courts were very very pleased with what they saw us doing um and so we started um offering family law workshops we recruited some some volunteers uh to teach classes pro bono on a saturday a workshop Mm, and the word got out that we were doing that and um there had always been some money available for that we were quite knew how to get a hold of them, but eventually we were invited to submit a proposal. And we now operate a family law self-help center. We have a half-time paralegal on staff and we we are not advocates, but the the process, the paperwork process is just a, a nightmare for most people. And we've served uh, well over 150 people since April. And um, the average income is about $2,100 a month. So these are people who would never be able to afford an attorney. And it's not just dads, you know, that that grant says we must serve men and women, regardless of income. But we're seeing, of course, uh, low income people. And many times there isn't even any animosity. It's just I need to get this done. I don't know how. Show me the forms to fill out so I can get access to my children, get a formal parenting plan in place. Um, you know, help me out. So um, that's that's been a, a fantastic uh, development. Uh, for us has brought a lot of men into our fatherhood classes as well. And then unsolicited, we got a $30,000 grant to teach parenting education to high school kids. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah. I, everybody that, that I share that story with says that that's fantastic. That's where we need to yeah. start. And, and I'm convicted that um, relationship training is what's really needed in our society today, that uh, we allow relationships to fall apart far too easily uh, no fault divorce is um well you know many people think that that it was the homosexual um agenda that redefined marriage because it's now the federal court has said homosexual marriage is legal and many people think that's when marriage was redefined but um i've read one author who says no marriage was redefined when no fault divorce became the law you know who signed the first no fault divorce law Oh, Ronald dude. Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California. Oh wow! In 1970, and so you, divorce used to be hard, and it was a horrible process. You had to, you know, paint the other person as as a wicked, horrible human being, and it was public, and you know, husbands and wives feuding, and and um, but fault had to be demonstrated. You know, there had to be something that the other party had done, violence or infidelity or uh, lack of financial support, okay? Some fault had to be demonstrated. But now, no fault divorce. Or ended the divorce rate for second marriages is higher than the divorce rate for first marriages. What's the common factor <laughs> there? It's me, you know? Um, <laughs> and so I think if we had a, a system of, of where people could be encouraged to stay in their marriage and find the tools to do that, that... Uh, our society would be a whole lot better off. Kids would be a whole lot better off. So the, the newest thing that we're doing is a co-parenting curriculum. And we just launched okay. that last weekend, a six-hour course. Um, 
developed by a ministry called One Heart, Two Homes, or Co- Co-Parenting International, I think it's called, but the, the class is called One Heart, Your Child's Heart, Two Homes, Divorced Mom and Dad, Now Living Separately. Yeah. And it's a it's an excellent, excellent curriculum. We're really looking forward to that because we, our guys have said for you, since we started, how do we get this training to our mothers, you know, the moms in our in our organization or in, our, in my my social circle, my life, uh, I've changed. Our dads tell us I've changed, but um, the moms haven't. So how can we get them this training? That's so good. That's so good. And I, yeah, I know one heart, two homes, Tammy and Dave, Tammy and Jay Daughtry is a yeah, great people. And so just going back, um, the curriculum that you said you start with, what's, what's some of the things you cover? Some of the things of the topics you cover in there. These, this curricula is, uh, <clears throat> is a great combination of character growth through introspection and then fatherhood tips and, and parenting tips. So you get things for your toolkit, but you also get challenged to change yourself. And so we look at fatherhood history. Uh, are you aware that that the way you parent is largely the way you were parented? And <clears throat> did you have an absent or abusive father? And uh, what what effect does that have on on the way you parent? Um, we challenge men to take better care of themselves health wise. Um, we ask, we go through several exercises about identity and, and worth. How do you see yourself? And um, we talk about purpose. Men need purpose. And when uh, a man loses his purpose, he loses access to his children, loses his marriage, loses his job, come home, comes home from war. Even. Uh, men are without purpose. And a man without purpose is, is an idle man, a useless man, perhaps even a dangerous man sometimes so um and then we move into the relationship skills area communication uh discipline is is a great topic discipline versus punishment most guys don't realize there's a difference that the word discipline means to teach uh and and uh, they've never done that um uh, and uh in the in the back of the workbooks is uh is an appendix called Ages and Stages, and it shows where your child should be at certain ages, uh, physically, emotionally, and socially. And it opens men's eyes to, um, they have sometimes much higher expectations for child behavior than, than is realistic. So um, it, they begin to see, this is interesting, there's almost a sense that in many of these, with many of these dads that their children are objects and not human beings. And mm-hmm. when they begin to understand, relate to them as as kids with dreams and aspirations and feelings, um, they uh, they change. They change. Let me a quick story. Uh, one dad is in court. <clears throat> Ex wife says, "So you took a parenting class? Big deal." He says, "You know what our four year old daughter says to me now? She says, Dad, you don't you don't get mad at us anymore. You don't yell at us like you used to.'" And he said, I made that decision to change the way I was parenting. At the end of the second class, I had um, just, he'd been with us just four hours. But something about this atmosphere of reflection, contemplation, mm-hmm. introspection, he made that internal choice. <clears throat> I'm yeah. going to change the way I do this. Well, when a man does that, you just get out of the way. It's a very powerful and long lasting decision. So, um, that discipline section is a huge <clears throat> part of what we teach. We never say, don't yell at your kids. We don't have to, you know, everybody understands that. Um, in the in the advanced class, uh, I've taught that several times. Um, one of the themes that I teach is that human beings have two primary needs. One is for security and the other is significance. Security and significance. And when we... When our security is threatened, our primary emotional response is fear. Mm. When our security is threatened, our primary emotional response is shame. Okay? And we use anger to mask those things. We don't want people to see we're afraid. We don't want people to see we're ashamed. And so we use anger to protect ourselves. So I get the men to reflect on a, a prior time when they were angry 
and challenge them to look at that through that lens. What happened to your security? What happened to your significance? And then I ask the question, what happens to your kids when you yell at them? Mm. What's happening to their security and their significance? So emotional regulation, anger management, overcoming anger, uh, those are huge parts of, of what we do. And um, when we measure um, responses from men that the changes in themselves, they frequently say the number one thing is I'm more patient. I'm less anxious. I have more patience with my kids. It also is the thing they say they need to continue work on the most. So, yeah. uh, so what do the courts say about your curriculum then? I mean, you said you work with, you get referrals. What are some of the good feedback you've heard? Well, there was a, a case where a, um, a family law commissioner had worked with this couple for three years and <clears throat> they had lost their children to CPS twice during that three year period because of drug use. And it was never really, um, severe it was you know it wasn't a homeless addict in situation but this couple ended up getting supported by a church and then the dad gets enrolled in our program and he just got on fire you know particularly the discipline versus punishment thing he he told his co-workers he told his boss he told his wife he told his kids he told anybody that would listen he'd be standing in line at the grocery store and so in, in the final hearing, when their parental rights are, <clears throat> are finally being restored, we, we got to attend that. And she said, <clears throat> I just want to commend you for the change in your behavior. Um, you used to be combative, disagreeable. You fought the, the, the system. You fought the court. You fought the, the state. But there was a change in you somewhere along the way. And, and his attorney had read a letter. The man was too nervous to, to read the letter himself, but he was given all the credit to God and to the Spokane Fatherhood Initiative. And she used this interesting word, you've been transformed. Not a judicial term. <laughs> you know? mm, yeah. Uh, she said, you're, you're transformative for me. She was highly complimentary. So it doesn't work that way all the time. You know, uh, it's, it's not, uh, you know, a, a golden ticket, you know, to, paradise but um it it demonstrates a, a very substantial commitment and and most of the judges and commissioners when they see that they know the dad has gotten some very very good help and he's connected to a very positive organization now are you able to tie the gospel in at all or is this more of a you have to keep it you know well religion well, you can't keep it have it religious based but i can have biblical principles yes that, we're, we, we call ourselves a, <laughs> we are a faith-based ministry oh, okay we use secular material okay. and um, all of our instructors are Christians. <clears throat> and Great. so the, 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 the Christianity just kind of oozes out and v virtually every class has some addict who, you know, got clean because of Jesus and he can't stop talking about it. <laughs> so <laughs> so when, when the subject is introduced, we don't back away from it. Of course, we encourage that. We pray before our meals. Um, we encourage men to seek us out if they want prayer. And um, we, we, we are a little cautious because we do have a state contract. And, yeah. you know, so, um, and, but the state is not, it's really been a hands-off arrangement. They haven't tried to control the curriculum, insist on, on doing things. Washington is a very liberal state, a very blue state. And so, you know, we don't, we haven't had that issue and I don't anticipate it, frankly. They're, they're very, I very pleased. Now, but the, the, now going back to the public schools, doing the, the school uh, training, I do public school assemblies myself. I've done, you know, spoken in middle school, high school, public school assemblies. And I know that I can't um, openly proclaim the gospel because I do a full assembly. Like you can do an after school thing sure. with FCA, stuff like that. It's different. But when we do a full assembly for a school, speaking to the entire school, you can't give the gospel, but you can give biblical principles. Is that what you guys do where it's a... Um, is a full school assembly or full school assembly or the training yeah. you do is at a class like Dave Ramsey goes in and, and has it or what what do you what is it like for that? Yeah, we um we're teaching it to um the seniors at a at a small rural high school. Okay. In a small town called Reardon where I went and attended. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> there's a, a total of about 30 students uh, in two different classes and we have to use a curriculum provided by this grant it was developed by Iowa State university it's called parenting it's a life it's free to anybody that wants to use it huh. and the goal of this curriculum is to get 
students to delay parenting, to think about the consequences, the social, emotional, and economic consequences of having a child. And it, it's got a lot of case studies, group exercises where they interact with one another, they get up out of their chairs and and stand in a corner of the room to vote, you know, this particular choice in this case study. And um, it, it's really interesting um, to watch. They, they were The students were kind of, you know, hard to get responses out of the first two or three classes. The last two, we've done five now. They've been very, very good. They're getting more and more engaged. They, they're more comfortable with us yeah. um, teaching it. And so there's, um, yeah, I, I, I'd have to think about it for a minute about biblical principles that, that are there. But this, this most recent session was on uh, what's called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And, um, you know, I think the answer, the, the message coming out of that is you're, you're a valuable person and you don't need to be defined by your circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's about resiliency. And um, it's a pretty, pretty challenging message. Um, I'm, I'm really grieved by it. Um, the condition of families. And so I I think that um, relationship education like that is is desperately needed at, at all levels. Um, I just finished this book, The Two-Parent Privilege. Oh, wow. Right? Um, Melissa Kearney. And it, very interesting. Increasingly, having two parents is a privilege in our culture. Mm. And it's a privilege enjoyed by educated people and increasingly non-educated people are missing out. So um, she uses, she's an economist. It's a very recent book, 2023 publication. And she says that people with uh, high school educations and up are the ones getting married. But if you don't have a high school education, you're, you're far less likely to be married. And you're, you're going to, have a relationship that creates children, but it's not going to be permanent. You're going to cohabit with somebody. Um, here's some data. Uh, only 63% of children in America are being raised in a home with married parents. Wow. So a third, 30 kids in America are growing yeah. up out in a married household. More than one in five children in America live with a mother who is neither married nor cohabiting. So 20% of the kids in America live with a single mom who does not have a, a, a dad in the household, a man in the household, either married or not. Um, and she's she's quite direct about needing to support fathers. We need to foster a social expectation that fathers be present in their children's lives and support them financially and emotionally. And so in, in my lifetime, the out-of-wedlock birth rate has gone from 5% to 40%. But worse than that, among uh, women 25 and younger today, the out of wedlock birth rate may be as high as 80%. Mm. We're rapidly losing marriage as a social institution, and nobody seems alarmed by this. In particular, the church doesn't seem to be alarmed by this. Um, so God has given me this kind of fuzzy vision for addressing this that I'm I'm still working on. And maybe you and I need to have a cup of coffee in, in Georgia soon and, and <laughs> talk about this great ideas. So. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And and I think it's it's wonderful that you're teaching about parenting because you know, obviously one third of the kids in that school probably statistically or don't they don't have both parents in their life yeah. and, or in their home. And so you're able to teach them about that. There's so many kids growing up without a mom and a dad. And and it's so helpful for you to, to teach them that and to help them with that, that journey. So going back to, um, you know, with, with the men that you work with, the, what's some of the things that you've seen where they're breaking the cycle of fodlessness in their life? You know, they're, they're growing up, they had it. And, and even speaking to the, the dads that are listening to this, that maybe they're going to be a dad. They didn't have a dad growing up. Uh, what are some of the things you've seen these guys working through not having a dad, but now they are a dad. Well, our our greatest um, success, success story is a man who was separated from his kids for seven years and now has them back in his life. Uh, he had four children with the same woman, never married, and she was in and out of 
the relationship a little bit. There was a season where he had all three kids, I believe, under the age of five, raising them by himself. And she comes back into his life and they have another child. And then uh, he leaves. I, I don't know for sure if he was kicked out or or his own behavior may have contributed to that. But he uh, he had a season of addiction in his life. And then after about five years of separation from his kids, I had an encounter with with Jesus and God and and made this decision that seemed totally impossible at the time. He said, I want my kids back. And, and he enrolled in our classes. We helped him with his parenting plan. Largely, it was just coaching and encouraging. And it took two years because um, he had defaulted on a parenting plan. There was he didn't object to it, and it was very onerous what he had to go through. And so he finally meets all the steps. He he went through a bankruptcy in this in this time, and just wondered how on earth could I ever support support these kids. And um, finally, it happened in October of twenty twenty two, I believe twenty twenty one. Um, he gets them back. I was able to go to the second supervised visit. And we it was right before Halloween. Spofi bought the pumpkins and the carving tools and a bunch of other stuff to you know help with this. I think it's a two or three hour session. And I I was videotaping uh, this and I, I put them all on the couch. So here's dad in the middle, two kids on each side. And you can see this on our website, this video. And you hear my voice off camera say, what is it you'd like to say to the Spokane Fatherhood Initiative? Well, Dad leans forward, of course, his voice is the loudest and, and says, thank you very much. But his nine-year-old son, 10-year-old son, sitting next to him says, we love our dad. Hmm. Now think about this. this. This is the second time this kid has seen his dad in seven years. You know? And he, he says, we love our dad. He was three roughly when his dad left no contact whatsoever and about several months later the dad james is is apologizing to his kids he's got them for the weekend and he's apologizing for being gone those seven years and his son says dad i always knew you'd come back hmm. now there's there's the heart of god right yeah he knew he had a dad he knew his dad hadn't forgotten him, and he knew his dad was coming back. So this his dad was never there to help him learn to tie his shoes or play catch or throw a frisbee or help with his homework or ride a bike or bait a hook. None of those things, but he knew he had a dad. Where did that come from? How did he know that he had a dad? And, his, and why did he hang on to this? That that God was coming, that dad was coming back. It, it comes from God. We have this father hunger yeah. in all of us. Right. That's your ministry. God is my dad. Okay. But how many kids miss that? They don't have that hope. That they don't have this expectation that, that there's somebody who cares for me, who's championing for me, who's going to protect me and provide for me and teach me. Um, when that's missing in someone's life, it has a deep, profound effect on their sense of worth if i don't have a dad you know let me, let me I'm, I'm wandering a little bit from your your question but one additional story we had a booth at a at a neighborhood festival uh, one weekend in august a few years ago and three teenagers come walking up to me i'm the only person in the booth boy girl boy turns out they're all 15 and they didn't ask any questions about what is this what do you do you know with spokane fatherhood initiative sign they knew exactly what what we were about the first words out of that girl's mouth were is this where i come to get a dad mm. yeah yeah and before i could say anything she says what do i have to do to get a dad like is there a form i can fill out you know some words will you be my dad Ugh. so i asked her um what's going on with your dad and she said oh he's He's a druggie. He's got seven kids. I don't mean anything to him. But boy, it was that was a painful realization, wasn't it? So I offered to pray for her, and I prayed that she would come to see herself as God sees her, beautiful, created, special, one of a kind, created for a purpose. Yeah. And then that she would also come to know God's love for her as her father. 
I said, amen. And she says, God doesn't love me. I said, why do you say that? And she says, um, because I'm gay. Hmm. I said, well, <clears throat> the Bible says that every human being is created in his image. I can promise you that God loves you. And she said, okay, thanks. And off she went. Yeah. Do you hear the pain of this fatherless generation? Oh, yeah. Uh, what do I have to do to get a dad? Why am I treated this way? Why is my father not fathering me? Why don't I have the benefits of, of being raised by a father? And it's a very good question. Well, Ron, I really appreciate this, and I wish we could continue the conversation. We're about to get kicked off uh, Zoom, but... Yeah. I want to. I want to ask you. How do you find your ministry? Just real quick. Share your website. How do they find you on social Spofi, media? Yeah, spofi.org. S p o f i dot org. Okay. And, uh, yeah, lots of good information on there. You can find my email and, and phone number. I appreciate what you do, helping fathers break the cycle of, you know, not being a good dad and, and turning it around. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Sean. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode of Let's Talk About Fodlessness. We want to now challenge you to take the next step by e either starting a single mom community group in your church or with your ministry, or by joining our network of God is My Dad churches and ministries. Isn't it a great experience to be able to start a single mom community group? Yeah, and it's just, if you talk to single moms, a lot of times what they'll tell you is, the one thing they're lacking is that community, just a group that they can go in and they know there's no judgment. You know, everyone may not have the same situation. Everyone doesn't know what they're going through, but they can go in and they know there's no judgment. And, and it takes that kind of that restriction and that uh, wall down for them so that they can share and then that they can grow in Christ. And our single mom community groups are a wonderful ministry. And if your church can start one, we'd love to have you. We can help you get set up. We have the curriculum and all the resources you need. If you can't start one, we'd love to have you start by by joining our network of churches and ministries, our God is My Dad network of churches and ministries, where you can get your church or your ministry on our map and people can find you and find find your ministry in your church so that they can get plugged into your church or ministry locally. So check that out. You can find all these resources at lifefactors.org. We have books, we have all kinds of content on there at lifefactors.org. Check it out today.